All right, uh, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about how to analyze a designed experiment. And I just kind of have a, a fun hypothetical um, example here. And uh, this is actually for making um, chicken wings or buffalo wings. And I uh, haven't really carried this experiment out myself, but I think it would be kind of fun to uh, try. Uh, have some friends over and maybe give it a go. But uh, just kind of have some variables and some... Uh, you know, made up numbers here, but you know, what I have here is basically two levels and two factors. So for one factor, I decided to choose sauce. Okay, so you know, maybe we're using Frank's and maybe a, a different, you know, sauce would be like Cholula sauce or something like that. And then maybe a, another factor would be butter. So maybe, you know, I don't know, one tablespoon of butter versus four. Okay. So again, as I mentioned, you know, we got two levels here, two types of sauce, you know, two levels of, of butter quantity, and uh, four runs. So all the combinations come out to be four runs. And when you code those runs, or not the runs, but the actual factors, you know, we can uh, set the francs at a minus one level, and then the Cholula at a plus one level, okay? And, uh, you know, our butter, we got... Uh, low levels of butter and high levels of butter and so forth. So this is the combination that we can test. This is basically a run it all experiment. We have four runs, okay, and uh, we've randomized the order, which is always super critical. And uh, I've also included an interaction term here. So, you know, this is actually just multiplying factor A times factor B. And the interaction term, if it's significant, will tell us that you know, indeed, you, it's not a, there'll be lack of parallelism in the effects. In other words, you'll have to look at a graph showing exactly how the relationship between, you know, the sauce type and, uh, and butter will be. And some replicated responses, and uh, again, made these up, but, you know, these could be like a flavor scale, maybe like 0 to 9, 0 to 10, and, you know, you're imagining you've, somehow created a, a batch of wings with franks with low butter, you know, cooked it up, and then you have your friends over and you're going to give them a ballot, and, you know, they determine, you know, what their taste index is like, you know, how good is it taste. And then for the next batch, you do, you know, again, the franks sauce, maybe a higher level of butter, and again, you know, you serve it to your friends, and, uh, you know, say, what do you guys think about this? Of course, you probably want to do it in a blind study fashion, you know, not really telling them which combination uh, is which. You know, you want to kind of keep that hidden so they're unbiased, but uh, that's kind of an experiment you could do. So we've done the experiment, we've collected some data, and we can do some things, like we can average each of these rows, okay? So for this combination, the average is uh, average score of 7.4. You know, for this combination, 8.4. Uh, for this combination, you know, 5 and then a 7. Then the grand average is a 6.95. Uh, we can also calculate standard deviation, okay, based on those rows and uh, readings and the variance. So the variance is simply the square of the standard deviation. Uh, just doing an eyeball analysis, uh, we can definitely see that it looks like maybe the francs with the high butter produces a little bit higher score, uh, which stands to reason. But, you know, everything goes better with butter, I guess. And keep in mind, this part of the analysis is what I call a heuristic-based analysis. So it's not really super rigorous, but just a way to kind of get to the basic fundamental uh, you know, effects of what's going on here. So we've calculated some basic summary stats. And, you know, the next part here is, is really the kind of the, really the kind of the key to this whole analysis. So, for example, factor A, which was their sauce, what we do is we calculate the average of all the minus columns. So if you think of a group for factor A, where they're set at the low level, we're calculating the average of that level and then we're also going to calculate the average at the plus level so this would be all the readings for the different sauce type 
Okay, so if we look at our formula, we've basically calculated the the readings or the measurements for the second type of sauce. And we do the same thing for the butter, you know. We're going to average, you know, the level of uh, butter at the at the lower level and then also at the higher level. And then the interaction term is simply the product of, you know, the sauce type and butter and then we'll just average those values as well. But just looking at it, again, doing this eyeball analysis, this heuristic type analysis, we can see that, you know, going from the minus one level to the plus one level, so going from the francs, which is minus one, to the Cholula, which is six, you get a difference of minus 1.90 in the, you know, the like, liking uh, response. So going from minus to plus here, going from the minus francs to Cholula, we actually have a decrease. So it's saying that maybe the francs has a little bit better effect on, you know, the uh, taster's experience. Here, you know, we have going from the average of the minus ones, which is the low butter to the high butter, we have an increase of 1.5. So we have an increase in the score, you know, 1.5 units for this response. And then, of course, the interaction, which is actually very small here. One of the things, too, is, you know, we're going from minus 1 to plus 1 when we're doing our calculations, which is actually 2 units. Uh, when you do a regression, you know, the typical formulation is, you know, for every one unit change in the dependent variable creates a response in the, uh, or a change in the response of some, some amount. So we don't go two units, we say for every unit change. So we're just going to divide this change right here by two. So this will standardize it for a regression equation. And then I also choose the, chose the absolute value because I want to just see the magnitude. And for these values, I've actually graphed them using Excel in kind of this Pareto diagram. And it shows the effect size. So it says that factor A by far has the largest effect. So that would be the sauce type, followed by factor B, which is the butter and then uh, AB, which is the interaction term, which is, which is not that uh, potent of a, of, a, of a factor. So that kind of gives us an idea of just the magnitude of what we're looking at uh, in terms of what's being, uh, you know, how the to taster perceives the different components or the different factors that are being tested. Now, one of the things that we really want to talk about, too, is that you know, we want, want to talk about statistical significance. In other words, how how does an effect compare to the noise in the data? You know, because there is noise, you know, there's variability here. So you can calculate kind of the signal or the effect size, uh, which is kind of this heuristic formula, again, based on the sample size. Uh, divided or multiplied by the uh, change here, okay, squared. Not going to really go into the math about it, but it's it's kind of a heuristic tool, and it seems to work pretty well. And what we're going to do is take that effect and then divide it by the noise. So the noise we can actually get from over here, the variance. That kind of gives us a system uh, variability. We've taken the variance here. For each of these rows and average them and that gives us an overall idea of variability of the system. Again, very very heuristic based, you know. And what we're going to do is simply take, you know, this number divided by the noise, so it'll be signal to noise, and that gives us a value. So now we take that value and compare it to something called an F score or an F statistic. So this is kind of our critical value. And that's calculated simply by uh, using the F distribution in statistics. And the formula for our example is here, okay? A certain way to do it. But kind of a rule of thumb, if it's greater than four or four and a half, five, something like that, if this value is larger than this F score, 
This was called statistically significant. In other words, there's something more going on here than just kind of a random chance type effect. There's something that we need to look into. So you can see the signal to noise ratio is pretty powerful right here, which says that yes, indeed, you know, factor A and B are pretty significant. On the other hand, the interaction term says not so much here, so we won't worry about that. But what the real importance here is, is developing this predictive model. So what I've done here is this is your regression, basically. So we have an intercept term, which is your overall average. And then I've taken all these effects, okay, right here, and put them in here. So this is our regression coefficients, or basically the slope of the line for each of these factors. And by itself, it's not that interesting, but you can use a what-if calculator. So what that means is that you take this regression equation, and we didn't have to include AB, by the way, because it's not significant. And you can actually alter the factor level. So, for example, if I want to use the other sauce, you can see it's a decrease in the um, flavor profile. Uh, if I want to use, let's say, less butter, it's also a decrease. So you can actually kind of do what if and determine what the optimum level is. So if you're trying to really increase you know, flavor, you would want to go with, you know, the first sauce and a little bit more butter and you get a higher overall average there. So that's, that's kind of really the power of this analysis is to develop this what if calculator. Now this is a heuristic approach again, as I mentioned. Uh, you can also graph the relationship of the effects, okay, based on the averages at the minus level versus the averages at the plus level and just kind of get an idea of what direction uh, things are going dependent on the level. But if you want to do a little bit more formal analysis, you can do it in Excel. Uh, the only thing is you have to change the data around. So uh, what I've done here is, you know, copied the matrix uh, for our study. And for the response, I've simply taken this set of values right here, okay? and turned it on its side. So now we have this situation here. Actually, I've taken this one right there and copied it right here. So basically it's saying the first replicate has these conditions. The second replicate, you know, has the same conditions. The third replicate. So I'm basically stacking the replicates along with their, you know, corresponding design. And now you can actually use uh, Excel. So simply going by data, the data, data analysis, regression, and your input range. So input Y range, so that's your response. Just select that. Uh, your X range, so those are your factors, including your interaction effects, okay? We're going to use labels because we did include labels, otherwise you get a non-numeric output. Confidence level is like a uh, fishnet to capture the true coefficient because there's variability. You can actually have variability in uh, you know, what the true slopes are. And we're also going to put in, uh, we're going to tell it where to put this. So let's put it here again. So we're going to put it here, summary output. And we're going to do the line fit plots too. And this is kind of interesting. You can also do residuals and in, in the rest of it. But line fit plots is uh, worth putting in. And hit OK. It's going to say, do I want to overwrite? Say yes. So here's the analysis. So basically what it's done is it's created a new table. And it gives us the exact same coefficients as with our heuristic method. It gives us what's called the standard error of each of those uh, values, which is the variability. Uh, the p-value tells you significance or not. So we can just see right here that what is significant. Again, we've got uh, factor A is significant. 
you know, if we use that 0 0.05 cutoff, factor B is significant. The interaction term is probably not. And this gives us a lower and upper bound for the coefficient. So again, it's kind of a, like a fishnet that captures where the true parameter would be for the slope. And um, so that's good to have. And then it gives you our square value, which is the strength of the linear relationship. But what's also nice is it gives you these actual line plots as well. So we've calculated these here by hand you know, sauce, butter, A, B using Excel. But basically this actually will do it for you. So you can see that relationship exists in these as well. I like this one because it shows the actual values along with the predicted response. So it's saying that the prediction, uh, you know, versus the actual values is very similar. So that's a pretty good indication. So again, that's another way to approach this. Um, you know, I, I kind of like both ways. I do like the heuristic approach because it is a pencil to paper uh, plot, uh, you know, which is great. Uh, actually, these are redundant graphs there. But it gives you a way to actually get a feel for what's going on in a, in a more, in a less formal way. And then here, if you want an actual formal output, you can do it this way too. Uh, the same type of principle applies for a three-factor analysis. Okay, same table there. And also, um, you can do it for a four-factor study as well. So this would be 16 runs, and you can see that there's quite a few interactions to in evaluate here. So, again, when you put your data together, you should put all these interaction terms together. And they're simply multiplying you know, the factors together. So A, B, C, D is simply, you know, minus one times minus one times minus one times minus one, which is one. So that's how those interaction terms work. However, at this point, when you're getting this many, doing the heuristic approach is a little bit more difficult. You got a lot of formulas and you definitely want to go with the um, Excel regression method, which will do it for you automatically and it's a lot cleaner. So Anyway, I hope that helps. I know it's a lot to cover. There's a lot of great books on design of experiments out there. But uh, fundamentally, you're really trying to generate this prediction model here so that you can determine which levels give you the optimum uh, value that you're looking for. Uh, graphing is very critical. It gives you good ideas of which factors are important and the directions they're going. So. I uh, hope this helps, and um, we'll talk to you again.